when I published my first book, I, I received a lot of questions, and I found it very difficult to answer them. I mean, they say, like, uh, well, what's the name of the book? And they, I tell them, and they obviously never heard of it, and they say, well, is it any good? And you don't really know, and you suspect the worst. And they well, what did the reviews say? And there weren't any. <laughs> And I very early figured there's only one way to handle this. I quick wrote, sat down and wrote 145 more books. And, and now nobody asks the names. Nobody asks if they're any good. Nobody asks, if, nobody asks anything. They just say 146 books. Wow. Because, because, you know, if you stop to think of it, what's the difference whether they're good or not? Have you ever tried writing 146 bad books? <laughs> Of course, then the other question is, well, well how, do you, how do you manage to write all that? I'm constantly asked that. How do you manage to write all those books? And the answer is very simple. Well, well you know, you try all sorts of things. First, you tell them the truth. I work very hard, but that's not glamorous. Uh, and so I dig deeper, and I come up with something which is surprisingly true. I cut out the frills, like thinking. <laughs> you see, you don't believe me, right? Uh, but it's true, just the same. You realize how many books don't get written because of thinking? That is, you write the first sentence, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and that's fine if you'll keep on, but you don't. You commit the fatal error of thinking, and you say, not sufficiently dramatic. You write, you cross it out, you write, a dark and stormy night, that's what it was. And then you think, you say, no, it's too dramatic. Perhaps we ought to open on an air of uncertainty. Was the night dark and stormy? <laughs> and then you think some more, and you say, no, no, I, I, I'm ruining it. It's anticlimactic. And you say, it was a stormy and dark night. Well, this goes on forever, and you never write the book. See? Now, I don't do that. I start with the assumption that the way I say it the first time is right. As a result, I hate literary critics <laughs> who have been described to me as resembling, you should excuse the expression, eunuchs in a harem. <laughs> they can observe, study, and analyze, but they can't do it themselves. <laughs> of course, like my introducer said, I am best known for my science fiction, and that, I'll, that will always stay, no matter how many non-science fiction books I write, and that's the way I want it. Uh, my science fiction is undoubtedly the most unusual part of my output. It was the earlier, these, these were the earliest books I wrote, the ones on which my reputation stands. I am at present known as a keen-eyed peerer into the future, a person to whom the crystal ball is absolutely clear, someone who can tell what's going to happen, all on the basis of the fact I write science fiction. Once upon a time, I was widely viewed as a nut for the same reason. <laughs> I haven't changed. Staunch and true, I stand as I always have, but the world has changed. And one of the reasons for this is that very belatedly, humanity in general is discovering that the only relevant literature of our times is science fiction. Now, as long as we have had literature, we have dealt with all kinds of fantasies, all kinds of imaginings, but they have all rested very firmly on certain basics, on the fact that human nature is always the same, that a kiss is just a kiss, a sigh is but a sigh as time goes by. Uh, I was thinking sometimes of putting that to a tune. And, <laughs> And, of course, it's the easiest sort of thing to write, because if you write stories about uh, the present or even the past, you deal with a background which people know about. Uh, you don't have to explain what an automobile is or how a six-shooter works or anything of the sort. In fact, you don't even have to know how a six-shooter works. You just point it. Uh, but if you write good science fiction, you see, you're dealing with a different, a different society, a different background, and you have two things to do. Uh, on the one hand, you have to explain the background. You have to talk about the kind of society that exists. 
And you mustn't skimp that because the society is sometimes the most interesting part of the story. On the other hand, you also have something going on in the foreground, events taking place against that background, and you don't want to skimp that either. So you have the difficult task, the very difficult task of uh, letting the events take place without obscuring the background and describing the background without delaying the events in the foreground. This is extremely difficult to do with the result that writing good science fiction, and I emphasize good because, you know, bad science fiction like bad anything is very easy to write. Uh, but writing good science fiction is the hardest thing in the world, really. I say it, and of all the people in the world, I know this best, because of all the people in the world, I'm the only one who's written a little of everything. So if I tell you science fiction is the hardest I know, and of course you can't tell me either, well, you just think it's the hardest because you are not a good science fiction writer, because uh, as a matter of fact, you're probably saying to yourself right now, this is the best science fiction writer in the world. <laughs> I'm told that this is a sign of lack of modesty on my part, but I said you're thinking it, not me. <laughs> Well, through most of history, the ordinary kind of writing with backgrounds that do exist or that never existed, uh, that are purely fantasy, have always been the natural kind of material to write because things haven't changed. This is the great secret of human history, that viewed from any given lifetime, things haven't changed. Yes, if you look at over thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, you recognize that someone discovered fire, someone discovered how to make pottery, somebody wove baskets, somebody herded animals, but all these things happened so slowly and so, so long distances apart and spread so slowly that to any one person living any one life, it seemed as though uh, everything was always the same. And you invented, uh, you invented important things to, to explain this, like saying, that what's good enough for my father is good enough for me, which is a sign usually of hopeless optimism, uh, because very often things got worse. But occasionally things did change, and almost invariably as a result of technological advance. Sure, there are all kinds of trivial changes, like a, like a plague coming in and killing off half the village, or, or a conquering army clattering by and killing off the other half. Uh, these changes, however vital they seemed to the people who happened to be enjoying them at the time, <laughs> are trivial in the sense that when it's all over, things go on as before. The real changes, the ones which permanently alter the manner in which people live, invariably come through changes in technology. And once people invented modern science, which could be used as a guide to changes in technology, these changes became, came to be so fast that people began to notice them in the course of their own lifetimes. Around 1800 and thereafter, for the first time, it began to dawn upon those people who lived in those sections of the world in which the Industrial Revolution was taking hold, it began to dawn upon them that things were changing, vitally changing, changing in such a way they would never be the same again. And it also began to dawn, and this would continue, that there would be further change in their children's time. And for the first time in history, people began to wonder about the future, not in the sense of, for God's sake, are we going to get a competent king once in a while? Or, or will this particular ruler, who's obviously incompetent, going to quit sooner or later? Things like that. Uh, <laughs> No, they began to ask themselves, <laughs> they began to ask themselves, how will people live in my children's time? Will we be able to fly through the air? Will we discover cures for diseases? Will we be able to communicate from, end to, from one end to the earth to another? That kind of question was never asked before because there was no occasion to. In short, the, 19th, the dawn of the 19th century was also the dawn of the discovery of the future. And for the first time, people, being curious about the future, 
began to satisfy that curiosity the only way they could, short of a time machine. They began to imagine and to write stories describing life as it might be in the future. And with that, science fiction came into being. Now, there are various ways of defining science fiction and deciding which was the first science fiction story. There have been times in which I've tried to say that the first science fiction story was one called Somnium, written by Johann Kepler in 1630-something, because it was the first story that dealt with a radically different uh, background, that of the moon, which had respect for the findings of science. Kepler actually tried to describe the moon as it really was. Uh, however, if we restrict ourselves to changes in technology, not just a radically different background, then perhaps, and I must admit I stole this from Brian Aldiss, who has recently written a book called The Billion Year Spree, then perhaps the first modern science fiction book is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, because that deals with a kind of society that might result if people learned more about the nature of life, as indeed they seem to be doing in 1800. In 1798, Galvani, this Luigi Galvani discovered that electric shocks caused apparently dead muscles to contract as though they were alive, so that people began to think perhaps electricity is the basic substance of life. And if you take an otherwise dead body and fill it full of electricity, you'll bring it to life. And uh, Mary Shelley used this as her basis for the story. And then along came Edgar Allan Poe, wrote some more. And then came Jules Verne, who was the first science fi professional science fiction writer in the sense he was the first person to make a living primarily out of science fiction. And he was extremely popular, too. He was the first popular science fiction, which is, I suppose, the reason he made a living out of it. However, through most of the, in fact, through all of the 19th century, science fiction was not considered very, it was amusing. It was amusing the way horror stories were amusing. It was amusing the way dime novels were amusing. You didn't really think it applied to real life. It is, in fact, you didn't even think science fiction applied to real life in my day. And when I started off in the 1930s, I remember reading science fiction in the 1930s, and those were the times when I first place I had a big, deep discussion of my, with my father as to whether I was to be allowed to read science fiction, and I skirted, I skirted the very edge of being assaulted physically. And, uh, and then once you overcome your father, playing upon his deep love for you and all that, and also threatening to jump out the window, uh, <laughs> then you have to tackle your teacher, who must never know that you read science fiction. Uh, and you have to tackle the those wise guy kids who don't believe in reading science fiction and laugh at you if you do. 